I'm Al Clace. I've been building crystal sets for a while. I guess I got serious when my son could count to 100, and I made him count turns on a oatmeal box. He's 35 now, so I guess it's been 30 years. Uh, as many of you know, I used to live out in Flemington, and I was kind of spoiled on crystal sets from there because you know, a reasonable crystal set, you could hear Canada easily. A good crystal set, you could hear Chicago or Nashville or maybe even uh, New Orleans on a good night. About six years ago, I moved to Jersey City. There's a local every 40 kilohertz. Uh, your chances of hearing anything in between them are just nil. So crystal set progress sort of came to an end. Uh, I built a demo set for the museum. And then I said, well, maybe it's time to get back to crystal sets in, in sort of a serious way. And one of the back burner projects I had, you can't see it here, but this, this is a picture of a Telefunken field radio from World War I. And in fact, this used to be in the, uh, in, in the museum at Fort Monmouth. Of course, now it's in a crate behind the uh, be, be, beside the lost ark in that, uh, <laughs> in that warehouse somewhere, never to be seen again. But one of the interesting things about it is that the, the set was analyzed by the Bureau of Research and Inspection in Paris, which was the unit that, uh, that Armstrong was assigned to uh, during, the, during World War I. So there's a bunch of interest and a bunch of tie-in to InfoAge and Armstrong and all that kind of stuff. And now, what this is, don't think of it as a crystal set from the 20s or 30s or you know, your, your Fillmore thing with the sliding contacts and things. This is what passed for a communication receiver 100 years ago. And it's a double-tuned circuit which means that it was based on Marconi's 4-7 patents from, from 1900. Um, and the interesting thing about the Telefunken set is the US Army had a similar set called the BC-14 that had been designed by the French and was built by DeForest and a couple of other people in this country. And I've worked with them, and they're kind of crude and ineffective. And I got to look at the schematic that R and I drew for this one, and it's got some really interesting features. For one thing, they were smart enough to tap the detector down on the secondary, so you're going to pre so you're going to have some cue and actually some selectivity. They've got a separate on-tuned secretary secondary, so that when you go to, you don't know what's on the air. You just want to take a quick look around. You use it as a single tuned radio and you can find a signal pretty quickly. And in addition to that, in a double tuned set, if you're operating it loosely coupled, which is the normal situation to get maximum performance, loosely coupled, you can go ahead and calibrate the secondary dial. And the Germans had done that. We just had 0 to 100 numbers and maybe a little tag off the side or something. but. Like I say, this is what passed for a communication receiver 100 years ago. Uh, I want to build one that kind of looks like this, but there were too many things I didn't know about the design of the coils and what was really going to need to happen. So we ended up like so in one of the boxes from, uh, from the Kirkut collection. Uh, primary is here, tuned by a primary condenser here, and the coupling is managed by swinging the coil. Secondary um, actually tunes the broadcast band in two bands. There's this current theory that if you do that, you can get better selectivity at the top end of each of those bands than, than, it, than if you're trying to tune a three to one frequency range. So kind of experimenting with some different concepts here. This has an audio transformer in it, feeds a sound-powered headset, which makes it quite sensitive. Um, and one of the things you may have seen in the set I was playing with down at InfoAge, there's a micro ammeter in series with the detector, 
which for reasonably strong signals actually gives you an S meter and you can compare things and see if you're making improvements when you're, when you're making changes to the thing. Uh, from Jersey City, uh, this gives you 18 listenable stations. Uh, the 50 kilowatt guys that are within 10 or 12 miles will drive a horn speaker. <laughs> so uh, I've been pretty happy with it, enjoyed playing with it, and, uh, and we'll see what happens. The other part of my message is I want to chastise all of you. Build, build crystal sets while you still can. I mean, for all we know, the AM band may go down the digital rat hole, and then where are you? <laughs> And what I already, I don't think that's, I don't think that's really going to happen in my lifetime. But what is happening is those 18 stations, only about eight of them speak English. <laughs> okay, so do, do it now. Build a crystal set. It doesn't have to be this complicated. If, if you have some young person whose mind you can poison, <laughs> help them build a crystal set. You may remember a few years ago, we ran a crystal set seminar. Who, who attended that? Bunch of you. OK. We, we may want to do that again. The, the, the situation has become more complicated in that parts are disappearing. We can probably still round up variable caps, which are one of the crucial parts. But before, you could go to Mauser and buy the little ceramic earpieces for $2 a piece. They don't exist anymore. Anybody that has them wants $10 for the earpiece. I, I think what we will likely do is get a conversation going. We'll empty out junk boxes. We'll round up parts from, from down at the museum. And we'll help anybody that wants to build a crystal set to do it. We could go so far as to set up a separate email reflector for messing with crystal sets. I don't know if that's necessary or not. But talk to me. Let me know your thoughts. Let me know what you want to do. Uh, but I, you know, crystal sets are magic. I mean, all the energy that gets to your ears came from the transmitter. And when the transmitter is 1,000 miles away, that's kind of a thrill. And uh, what kind of antenna we use? Uh, uh, it's, a, it's the 80-foot doublet I use for ham use. It's about 20 feet in the air. And uh, I mean, I'm- Could you have used a loop? You, you could use a loop, but you, 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 well, a coil this big, you can hear the strong stations without an antenna where I am. But uh, you, can, you can build loop sets of various sorts. Uh, my tendency is to build something that, like I say, a communications receiver. and and have it, have it really perform. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff on my website. Just Google Al Clace, you'll find it. Uh, the, the New Jersey Antique Radio Club PGXS, pretty good crystal set, uh, is, is a good design. It's a reproducible design, and you wouldn't be, that's not a bad place to start. Is so, this on your website yet? It's on my website. This one? Uh, there, not yet. Okay. Not yet. It will be, but. Uh, uh, that's it. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> build, build a radio. Yes, Gary. How do you think the sensitivity that is? You're thinking it under 100 microvolts? Um, microvolts is a little hard to, to judge. I, can, I can't. I, I cheat. I own lab grade test equipment. Here's the deal, sort of, with crystal sets. And, and think about dBm decibels to a millivolt. A zero dBm signal is real strong, OK? A th that's a milliwatt coming off the antenna. 30 dB down is a thousandth of that, a microwatt. That's still a respectable, listenable signal in a decent crystal set. You get down to minus 40, now it's starting to get serious because your detector stops giving you a one-to-one -one output for the input and starts giving you half to one. And so the, you're heading for the last roundup pretty quickly. And the other thing you find out is that when I made measurements 12 years ago uh, and do them again now, uh, my hearing's down by about 10 dB. <laughs> anyway, sound-powered headset, reasonable hearing, good design, you can get down to about 
minus 60 dBm. That's a picowatt. That's a billionth of a watt. And so that's the kind of range you're talking about. Yes? Two questions about First, what is a sound power headset? Oh, oh, and oh. Is, do that first. That's yeah. Uh, normal headphones, you've got a magnet and a metal diaphragm. Right. Years ago, the phone company had a requirement for telephones that don't use batteries. So you have a dynamic microphone that generates enough signal to run the, run the earphone. And so they leaned on this big time, and what they came up with was a so-called balanced armature design. You've got a mag an electromagnet with two coils. You've got an armature that tilts this way, and a push rod that moves the diaphragm. Transmitter and receiver look pretty much the same. Like I say, the phone company blows your mind. They get a higher sound pressure level at your eardrum than they had <laughs> at the transmitter diaphragm. Okay? And what these are used for, even to this day, is the intercoms on ships and submarines. Sound powered, because everything else can be shot away, and as long as you have a pair of wires, you can still talk. So, okay, they're, they're still commercially available. Not commercially, you dig around for them, you watch in the ham fest, you buy them off sound eBay or something. Powered. Sound powered. Uh, again, on my website, there's a sound powered headphone spotters guide. I'll tell you what to look for. That was question one. Yeah. Question two. This, uh, you said it's dual tune, so there are two tune, tune circuits. Yes. And then. Um, and the detector is uh, after the second tensor? Yes, that, okay. okay. We don't have it, we don't have any chalk. Uh, I've got a drawing here you probably can't see. Uh, like I said, it's, 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 it's the Oliver Lodge circuit. The input circuit is a so-called open circuit. It's series capacitor and an inductor in series. That in, tune, in turn is in series with the antenna which less than a quarter wavelength, looks like another capacitor to ground with a signal source and a radiation resistance in it. So you tune that up, now you're getting maximum current out of your antenna. down from the antenna. Now you couple that to a parallel tuned secondary, which is where the detector's connected. And variable coupling is important because there's so-called critical coupling point where there's maximum energy transfer. You can also back away from critical coupling and get increased selectivity at the, co at the cost of sensitivity. In fact, that, that sliding coil Marv had up here is a so-called loose, Navy loose coupler from the 1910 era, which is basic circuit for doing that. By, there's, there's a lot of losses in those, and after Telefunk had leaned on it, by 1914 or so, you, you get into twisting coils with switch taps and things. Other questions? Yes? On the sound power earphones, so you're saying they're more sensitive than conventional uh, they, they're, they're, they're as much as 18 dB more sensitive than a standard headset. Right. So how do they compare, I'm sure you're familiar with the Clement brush crystal headsets? Uh, the, 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 the brush crystal headsets, uh, again, on my website, there's some numbers. and if I remember them roughly, you get things like the, the World War II pilot's headsets and things, and their, their sensitivity, what, you can, what minimum signal you could hear, maybe minus 60. A decent headset like a pair of trims or, and the, the crystal headsets fall into the same range, about minus 70. Uh, Nathaniel Baldwin's, which are a balanced armature design, are maybe 5, d five dB more sensitive than that. And the ones the telephone company did, as much as, uh, but minus 88, I think, was the I best number. I thought the first ones because the, the relatively much higher repeatings were a lot more sensitive. Well, there, there's, there's, a lot of, there, there's a lot of ins and outs to that, but I'm talking about uh, sensitivity per, per watt going into them. And they're not they're not that sensitive. There's a case for your detect for your there's a case for the load on your detector being a high impedance, and 
even though, even though those things you know, are infinite DC, they're still capacitive and I don't know, they're 10, 15 K ohms or something are like these that. High no, these are, these are about 600 ohms. Really? So that's, that's why I say there's a, there's a, there's, 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 a, there, there's a 100K to 600 ohm transformer in there that takes care of that. There's also an advantage to uh, being a, a standard 2000 ohm DC headset is about 10K ohms. If you put a diode on that and hook it to the top of your coil, you, you're loading the coil too much. You need to tap it down on the coil. With the higher, with the 100K, you can put the diode to the top of the coil. That keeps more voltage on the diode, and you can get down to lower signal levels. Smart. Yeah. You, so you have a transformer in there to use that headset. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. The headset won't do you any good without the transformer. Wait, is it? A, you got to ro uh, roll your own. Or? But, nah, you look. You look around. There's all kinds of things you can do. This happens to be a UTC A11. Darren, what's it worth? An A11. Yeah. Oh. Probably about 200 bucks. <laughs> okay, you know, but uh, you can you can do you can do things with uh, wind of voice coil transformers and stuff like that. You get cheaper stuff. Chinese microphone transformer. Yeah, there's there's a bunch of trans that you, you you look we can if you get interested in that we can find you a transformer. I just over the years had glommed things when I saw them. I have a, I have a, line, a linear standard that's an even better transformer. Yeah. How do they hold up? What the, durability. the headsets? Yeah, exactly. they're they're military. They're made so swabbies can't break them. I know, like, you know, you get the, the normal ones, the wires are broken and all that. So. You you, well, these come. This I, I replaced the wires on these. You know that, depending on what you get, but uh, uh, you might have to do some work to get them going. But the elements are generally put pretty reliable. Yes. Al, have you tried biasing the detector? Um, uh, in, in, in the past, yes, but it doesn't make that much of a difference. You might get yourself a couple of dB biasing a detector, but it just, it just isn't magic. It just doesn't solve the problem. If you tap the coil in some different spots, are you able to bring it up a little bit to shortwave, or would you lose so much uh, sensitivity? That well, you can, you can do that. And in fact, you can build shortwave crystal sets. And part of the Jersey City story here was I had done that years ago, and I, I'm there, and you can't hear out from between all these guys every 40 kilohertz. I said, well, let me build a short wave set again and just see how that works. The powerful international broadcasters are no longer, no longer beaming to North America. So I threw together a short wave set. Yes, I heard Cuba. Yes, I heard Tennessee, and that's about it, you know? <laughs> not, not exactly as rewarding as I hoped. Uh, shortwave crystal sets are worth taking a look at, but you, you generally, you know, you're talking about, you're talking about several times more frequency, so you ought to just make shortwave coils rather than trying to tab. Marv. Nothing to do with radio, but uh, I was a swabby, and uh, when in a, in a drill, Sometimes you're assigned to be the phone talker. Uh -huh. And what happens is you get like six to eight messages all lined up in a row. Everybody's trying to send in a message and then get the answer at the same time. Uh -huh. So you got to remember six to eight messages. And for each one, you say, wait, and you answer the first one. Then you got to remember the second one and answer that one and that one. And I tell you the truth, it's a true art, quite honestly. Well, I couldn't do that at my age. Well, I, I, I wasn't that. So, uh, I mean, just not to toot my own heart, but we had a drill, and the captain said, and he, he, he tried to find out who was the phone talker, and I was. Uh -huh. he, said, he says, that's the best phone talker he's ever heard in the Navy. Because I was able to want, remember the Rem lineup. And keep it going. Six to eight messages and answer each one. And so they had one. They had one loop through the whole boat. Well, yeah, but it all came into. You had a. Well, it wasn't one loop through the whole boat, but everything that came into engineering from everybody else was one loop. Yeah. So you had, you know, six right. messages 
eight messages lined up, and everybody wanted an answer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so you had to remember, remember each one and, and sort of put them in a what they call it, you know, in a, uh, uh, oh, like you're an answering machine. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Take furious <laughs> notes. <laughs> but those things were very good. Oh man, you could hear them. Yeah, they're 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 clear and, they and loud and. and did those things have, did I think it's 10 positions on the one MCs? So you could, you know, you could select to whom you want to talk to, which in the Oh, oh, oh. The, so the, what's this one yeah. through the line? No, you, oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know how they were wired. I just knew uh, they used them. Because, like I say, you get everything shot away and it could still work. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, let's leave somebody else talking. <laughs>